So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to a special episode of the Trauma Therapist Podcast, uh, joined by Dr. Peter Levine. Peter, welcome. Thank you. Dr. Peter Levine received his PhD in medical biophysics from the University of California in Berkeley and also holds a doctorate in psychology from International University. Peter's worked in the field of stress and trauma for over 40 years and is the developer of somatic experiencing method. Peter's original contribution to the field of body psychotherapy was honored in 2010 when he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the United States Association for Body Psychotherapy. Peter's written a number of books, among them um, one of the most famous books, Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma. Uh, Peter, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me sure. at such sure. short notice. So uh, first off, where, where, are you, where are you right now? Where are you calling from? I'm uh, in Encinitas, California. Okay. Uh, North Sa uh, San Diego County. Okay, got it. A good place to be here right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, how are you, first off? I'm doing okay. You know, my throat's a little sore because I've been doing a lot of interviews. And, and then I, I received another Lifetime Achievement Award from the Psychotherapy Network. So I was uh, talking quite a bit of time okay, for well that. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Thanks. So, I mean, I wanted to reach out to you. Obviously you're, you're one of the main inspirations in this field. Um, how about if we start a, a kind of a macro level and dial it into uh, more of a uh, individual level about, you know, what people can do. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts sure. generally on what is going on um, and with regards to trauma and stress and so yeah. forth. Well, I mean, of course, this is a time of a great deal of distress. And, um, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I'm not sugarcoating it. But it also offers some opportunities. You know, um, first of all, I would change the, 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 the labeling when they say, uh, social distance. I think really it should say physical distance because we really need to connect socially. I mean, just you and I right here in a way where through this contact, we're, we're co-regulating ourselves. Right. It's really, really important. So, and, and sometimes words mean a lot. So I think it's important to think that social contact is important. Um, but of course, physical, uh, physical distance is also extremely important. Um, and I said, what would I say? I would say a couple of things. You know, fear is something that physically happens in the body. Our guts tighten, our jaws tighten, our shoulders tighten and bracing, our guts tur twist and turn and butterflies. And all of that, in a way, what it does is it tells us, it, it's registering what's going on in the body and tells us there's threat. Now, the thing about this kind of threat is that it's invisible. And, you know, it's not like a threat that you can localize. But again, there are things that people can do. Um, I really suggest when, when you're home to, um, to take time to really be with yourselves, to listen to music that moves you. I'm literally to let the music move you, to, to feel the music, music, to let your body move. And if you're with another, if you're fortunate enough with a, 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 a family, a family unit or, or, um, uh, or a, 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 a partner, um, dance together, move together, allow your body to move because the, because the threat is from outside because it's not, I mean, it's not localizable, it's outside. And so again, we, we were unable to, to localize the threat and do something about it, but we can, again, do what is the most sensible things to do, which is to minimize, you know, uh, contact with other people physically. Um, you know, there's some exercises that I, I do that can be very helpful especially when working with something like an unknown virus. 
And the idea here is, is, is to interrupt the feedback loop that's coming from the belly uh, back up to our brains. I'll give you just a little physiology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a nerve that goes from the back of the brain stem down throughout the whole body and, and connects with almost all the organs in below the diaphragm, as well as also the heart and the lungs. And what happens is when we see something horrible, somebody's hit by a car or something like that, our guts twist up. And that's the vagus nerve. That's the nerve that's winding around the body. Vagus is for vagabonds, the Latin to, you know, to, uh, yeah. So anyhow, um, this nerve is the largest nerve in the body. And over 80% of that nerve is sensory. In other words, it's actually taking information from our guts and relaying it back to our brains. And then so what can happen is you see something that's really uh, scary, horrible. You twist up. That twisting is then relayed up through that same vagus nerve and is amplified in the brainstem. So it maybe starts with a, oh, then gets a, oh, and then, oh. And then when it becomes chronic, we don't have any energy. It's like our life force has disappeared. And again, this is so important with this kind of a threat because it's something that actually, it, the, oh, the only way we know it, that we've had it, is again, because of the distress. But if we have the distress, then it, it fools us into thinking that we do have the virus. So it's really important to uncouple that. So I'm gonna give you a simple exercise. I'll do it first and then I'll uh, invite you, all of the people who are watching, to also do the exercise with me. So I take an easy, full breath. And on the exhalation, I make the sound voo, as though it's coming from my belly. And I let the sound and the air all the way out and then just allow a new breath to come in, filling belly and then chest, and then again repeat the voo. So I'll demonstrate it, I'll do it a couple of times, and then anybody who wants to join in, please. Now it can bring up feelings, I want to say that. Um, but, the, but I think it's much better to know your feelings than to not know your feelings, especially at a time like this. So here is an easy full breath. <laughs> Letting the breath and the air go all the way out. And then I'll let the breath come in on its own, filling belly, chest. And just rest and notice sensations, feelings, thoughts, images, pictures. So I'm wondering if you're willing to say, Guy, what you're noticing right now. Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind, it, it feels very meditative to me. Mm -hmm. yes. That sound feels very, I don't know, I, I guess I associate that sound with monks in a sense that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. I mean, look, people have been chanting. Religions and spiritual traditions have been chanting for thousands of years, literally thousands of years, probably ten thousands of years. And uh, but this is a little bit different. This, I mean, it's it's it, there's a lot of overlap, of course. But the idea here is you want to change the information that's coming back up from the guts to the brain. So if we're shut down because we're perceiving this invisible threat, what we want to do is be able to come out of that shutdown so that we're able to engage in life and do the things that are necessary to protect ourselves and our loved ones. So what you're doing is instead of this feedback loop with negative consequences, this amplification feedback, the stress, 
you're now shifting that and saying, oh, okay, things are okay. And that is like a meditative state, but it's specific because the idea is to and vibrate the sound literally coming from the receptors in the guts so that the all clear signal can be sent to the brain. One of the, one of the, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I guess I really appreciated about what you're saying here from the get-go is, you know, when I, when I asked you a question and you responded, you didn't say, well, we have to remember to do this or think about this or do this. You right away was like, we need to engage our body. We need to move. We need to dance. We need to, and that, there's something about that that just made me feel grounded all of a sudden. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, it, it re really is about engaging our bodies. You know, wh when I started to develop somatic experience in, in the early 70s, I was fortunate in a way that I didn't know because the definition of trauma as PTSD had, was still another 10, 12 years, you know, in the future. So I didn't know that it was supposed to be an incurable brain disorder, brain disease. And what I did discover is when the things like bad things happen to us, of course they happen also in the brain, they happen in the brain, but they equally happen in the body. And what we need to do in trauma, we brace in fear, we collapse in helplessness. And so what we need to do is have new experiences in the body that contradict those of the fear and the helplessness. And then the body is signaling to the brain that things are okay. And that's what we need to know. And we can also support each other. Uh, I would suggest if you're together with somebody um, to practice these exercises together. You know, um, there's a, a Motown song that goes something like, it takes one to stand in the dark alone it takes two to let the light shine through. So when we're guiding each other and being there together in these, as you call them, somewhat like meditative states, then we're able to have a little distance from what's happening. Because it's not helpful to be stirred up, to be stirred up, to be stirred up. Unfortunately, the most confusing kind of messages are being sent out by leaders. One leader is saying one thing, then another leader says something the opposite. And that's really, really a bad thing to do uh, when you need to be calming people. Again, we don't want complacency, but we don't want people stirred up in panic. So, you know, um, some years ago, uh, a number of years ago, this was uh, after the 9-11 uh, attack, terrorist attack, and I was asked to be in a think tank on counterterrorism. And the people there were people from the Department of Defense, from the FBI, from the CIA, the State Department. I mean, these are not people I'm usually in contact with. And everybody went around and, you know, gave their name and, you know, and what their background is. So when it came to me, I said my name. And I said, but I don't know why I, you invited me, you know. Um, I, I'm sort of the odd man out here. And they said, no, we've been following your work for the last several months. I said, ooh, <laughs> I don't know if that's so, <laughs> it's a little scary. And we want you to, to uh, set up a, a sub think tank called TTOT, take the terror out of terrorism is what they had wanted me to do. And one of the things I said is you have to have a consistent, believable, spokesperson, somebody like a Walter Cronkite. Uh, I actually have a video of Walter Cronkite uh, announcing uh, President Kennedy's death. Very, very clear, very powerful, and also emotional. Franklin Des Delano Roosevelt, FDR. The only thing we have to fear is the fear itself, how right on mm -hmm. that was. So again, that's not the clear messages we're getting now. So we have to even more rely on ourselves and our ability to self-regulate. So we're not stirred up. Yeah. So and just, being stirred up and being stressed, you know, is one of the things that actually makes us more susceptible, not just to this virus, but to all kinds of other infections. 
And social engagement is a real important part of that. There's a wonderful video. People can see it on YouTube. I also used it in my lecture. Uh, it was really, really, really very, very special. It takes place in Italy, in Naples, and I think in Rome. And people come to their uh, windows or on their balconies and they start playing instruments. And if they don't have instruments, they get pots and pans and bang the pots and pans together. And so they're physically separated, but they are socially connected mm -hmm. and in rhythm with the music. That's the right thing to be doing. Those are the lessons we need to be taking. Yeah, I thank you for that. That was, um, that was posted recently. Right. Yeah. That was yeah. how they were, how, how Italy was, in a sense, uh, part of it was, was dealing with this. Yeah, that was really powerful for, if I may, for myself, you know, initially when all this started happening, I was, I was re really stressed and it got to a point where r really quickly I was like, wait a minute, I, I either I'm going to get completely dysregulated and stressed and I'm not going to be able to handle my two kids who are suddenly home or I've got to dial it down and realize, you know, what can I do? Because let's face it, I'm not out there. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not making masks, et cetera. Um, but again, you know, how can I regulate uh, myself in these times and balance that with trying to, to, to be informed? So that's a challenge too, right? Yes. yes. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is what we can do. This is what we do have control over. It's really the only thing we have control over. I mean, except to do the sensible things that need to be done. Um, but that's the good news in a way. And also it gives us an opportunity. You know, we are, everyone, myself definitely included, that we use a lot of things, a lot of activities as a way to not be with ourselves. And so, and this is an opportunity to be more connected with ourselves. I mean, it's gonna be real scary at first because we use this kind of hyperactivity as a way to not feel, but it's also a tremendous benefit to be able to feel. And what would you say to people, you know, you talked about that one exercise of taking in the breath and, Ooh, yeah. and you talked about feelings might come up and what about if feelings do come up for people they're like what would you what would you say i would say to notice the fear and you know fear is comprised uh, emotions are comprised of three things primarily but let's look at fear fear has is a particular bodily sensation twisting in our guts the shoulders tight or the neck tur the turtle response and the neck shortening. These are all, again, all things that the, the body does. And uh, they're sensations. But then we have thoughts. Oh, you know, I'm going to get infected. Oh, you know, all of these kind of catastrophizing thoughts. So noticing them as thoughts. Often when a thought like that comes up and I'm working with a person or just writing about it, I say it's when you have that thought, preface the thought with the sentence, I have the words that. I have the words that I might get sick. And that allows the person to separate a little bit from the thought. In other words, it, the thought is not reality. The thought is just a thought. I have the thought that. And that's cognitive behavior therapy does that kind of stuff very well. But again, you have to also, or even primarily, be aware of the sensations that are underlying the emotion. And then also there may be pictures or, or images that come into your mind's eye. So to be able to kind of separate them out enough, and you know, no feeling, no matter how difficult it is, is the end point. Mm -hmm. We're able to be with our feelings, to touch into our feelings. They will shift, they will change, and they will ultimately be more positive and will be, help us move through these difficult times, will be ways of actually creating more resilience. In terms of, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners here are therapists who I would imagine now are working yep. 
in terms of distance, you know, online or uh, telehealth in a sense. Um, Any, what would you say to them about suddenly they themselves might be, I mean, I guess everyone to a certain degree is stressed, but now you, so you have a therapist to a certain degree who are stressed and have to manage that and clients. Is there a difference in working one-on-one in a room and then now we're working, you know, like this, maybe a client would be working with. uh, Well, I mean, obviously it's not the ideal thing, but given the conditions, it may be the best thing. And, you know, when we communicate with others, it's not, I mean, whatever it is, maybe it's five or 10% the words, but the great majority is what we are expressing in our faces and our whole bodies and our voice. So if I am talking to you in a monotone like this and I'm not really modulating my voice, you're gonna tune out very quickly because we are programmed to pick up rhythm in people's voices. This happens in our earliest infancy, you know, after, right after we're born. We are tuned to the voice often of the mother. Um, and that is in itself can be soothing. So even if you're on Skype or Zoom or whatever this is, to be able to, instead of talking so fast and talking, to just connect with yourself first, then, because that's critical, because that allows us to come in with presence. When we're there, present within ourselves and present for another, then that helps them regulate. So be aware of your own fears and your own resilience your own strength and use that as a way of communicating that to the person that you're working with on the, you know, on the Skype or whatever media. Um, Also, and you can't do this as well, of course, uh, when you're not in person, but you'll be able to notice changes in the person's facial expression. Sometimes it happens in just milliseconds or a change in their breath. These are all things that are indicating there's a shift going back, going on in the person's experience. So often just bringing that to the person's attention. So you notice a spontaneous breath. And then maybe you say something like, yes, that's it. Just let that happen. And what do you begin to notice now? So you have invitational language. You have a rhythmic Uh, verbal connection with the person. These kind of things can make a really, really big difference. And um, so I think um, that Skype connection is really uh, a very valuable thing to be doing. Also for people just to be doing that with each other, with their friends, with their colleagues, with their friends, therapists doing it with each other, but not just therapists, everybody doing it. I mean, and to be careful not to catastrophize, to really be first with ourselves, be present with ourselves so that we're not catastrophizing, and then to share that quality, that energy with other people, people we care about, people we love, and um, people that we appreciate. All of those things, when we communicate them, really help the person settle in themselves as we, uh, yeah, thank you for that you know as we as we close up here and wind down you know in the beginning of our, of our talk here you talked about you know you, you wanted to make sure that you weren't you weren't sugarcoating things but i'm wondering if if there's an opportunity for the, the field the, the trauma field if you will with all of this i mean it sounds kind of crazy to think but you know, here I am, I'm reaching out to you, reaching out to some of the leaders in our field at this moment to, to address what's going on. What are your thoughts on that, Peter? Um, I think there's a shift going on, a profound shift. I mean, you know, that was, uh, I think that's probably why they awarded me the, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Psychotherapy Network, because this is now in the mainstream. It's no longer on the fringe. So this has crested. And again, you know, 
every challenge also is an opportunity. Again, I don't want to sugarcoat it, but it is a way of connecting more to our core selves. To, with, I mean, again, to do things that are nourishing, as I say, to sing, to dance, to, to move, to cook together. Those are all activities that bring people together and things that humans have been doing for thousands of years. Um, but just, if so I mean, just to be just to be clear, Peter, you're, you, what you're saying is it's it's almost vitally those things are vitally important for our health, our well being. Yes, our well being. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so, anyhow, the fact that we are now realizing what's important and what the piece, missing pieces are in psychotherapy, we are able to be much more effective therapists much, much more effective therapist. And then this will be helping all of our clients. And, uh, you know, I've even done in different situations, not like this, but after 9-11, I, you know, did a group with a group of people. I had groups like a town hall meeting. And again, we did some of these kind of exercises and help people to reconnect with themselves and um, make a boundary from all of the fear. So. So this is a, a time where psychotherapy itself is evolving very, very rapidly. And, you know, I think it's now, you know, the genie's out of the box. The missing pieces are now starting to come together. So, and, and, and none too soon, again, especially with the demands of this kind of uh, crisis. All right, Peter. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time, uh, especially since you've got a sore throat. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you want, I'll read one thing that was sent to me please. by uh, my, uh, my friends in, in, in the mountains in Switzerland. I believe it's written by a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, Irish monk, an Irish brother, and the poem is called Lockdown. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But they say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, this is what I meant about quieting inside of ourselves, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and gray and clear. They say that the, in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. They say that a hotel in the west of Ireland is offering free meals and delivery to the housebound. Today, a young woman I know is busy sending flyers with her number through the neighborhood so that the elders may have someone to call on. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques, and temples are preparing to welcome and to shelter the homeless, the sick, the weary. All over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are, and how little control we really have except for our own internal states and our relationships. Poem goes on, to what really matters to love. So we pray and remember that yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate and there does not have to be terror or panic. Yes, there is isolation, but there does not have to be loneliness. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but it does not have to be a disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be a rebirth of love. Wake to the choices you make as to how you live now. Today, breathe, do the VU exercise. Listen beyond the factory noises of your panic. The birds are singing again. The sky is clearing. 
spring is coming and we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul and though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. And the poem is called Lockdown by an, uh, by an Irish Capuchin Franciscan brother named Richard Henry. So I think I just leave all of you with this. And I imagine you can find the poem online. It's really, I would say, right on the spot. Wow, what a beautiful thing. Um, Peter, thank you so much um, for being here again. And I wish you well. And to all of you, to all of you, to be with yourselves, to be kind with yourselves and kind to each other. This is a time of potential great transformation. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Bye-bye.